Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the downtown for the latest of our uh, webinars. And I'm very pleased today to uh, say that we have got Lord Story of Chilwell, who's the Liberal Democrat spokesperson on education, families and young people in the House of Lords. But much of his political career, and I do mean much of it because it was very long, has been conducted in the cauldron of Liverpool City Council, where he served for 38 years. Oh, my God. <laughs> First elected in 1973, he became the youngest chair of the Education Committee from 1980 to 83, uh, when the famous Sir Trevor Jones was leader of the council. Mike was witness to the militant years and the aftermath under Labour until in 1998 the Lib Dems took control of the council with Mike's story as the leader. His party brought down the council tax and uh, transformed the reputation of the city and secured for the city the European Capital of Culture in 2008. Before then, Mike had resigned as leader of the council in 2005, uh, following, uh, I think it would be fair to say, some differences with the then chief executive, David Henshaw. Mike was then Lord Mayor of Liverpool from 2009 to 10, and it was in that year that the Liberal Democrats lost control of the council and began a spectacular decline while nationally the party was in coalition with the Conservatives. In 2011, Mike was created a peer of the realm where he continues to sit. That's uh, quite, a, quite a track record, Mike. You've been an observer and a participant in, uh, in the city's politics for very many years. Yeah, I was very tempted to say um, thank you, Michael Aspel, because didn't he uh, host This Is Your Life? The <laughs> laugh goes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I've, I've tried to give a sketch of what you've been up to, but it is 15 years since you were leader. Uh, um, so, what have you been up to in those years? Um, well, I think I like to be busy. Um, I, I like to be doing things, and I've, and in some ways, I've, you know, coming off the council um, was a good thing, or getting out of Liverpool politics was a good thing for me. Uh, as you've said, I lead for my party on education in the House of Lords, and that is really, uh, you know, a, a full-time job. Before um, COVID, I would go down to uh, to London on Monday morning, run corn, meet all the various MPs getting the same train, uh, and come back on Thursday night. Occasionally, we would have Friday sittings, and it was, it was full on, really. Um, so if ever there's a ministerial statement, I have to respond for my party, uh, written questions, oral questions. I'm also on a select committee. I'm, uh, I'm currently on a select committee looking at youth unemployment, which will report uh, in the summer or no, in the autumn, which I'm, it's sort of two hours uh, a week. I'm involved in a number of other organisations. I'm a um, patron of the Royal Society for Life Saving. I was involved in uh, as a patron of the Strawberry Fields project, uh, raising money to get uh, John, you know, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, uh, you know, Beatles site uh, as, a, as a visitor attraction, attraction, also a college for disadvantaged young people. Uh, I'm a patron of Careers Connect, and I've just been a patron of an organization called Summer Camps, which believes that all young people should have the opportunity to have a, uh, an away from home experience. So yeah, I keep very busy and I do a bit of, Politics as well. I helped my wife win the local election campaign in in Liverpool in Chilwell. We overturned a Labour majority of twelve hundred, and Carol won. So she's now a councillor in Liverpool, uh, and I'm currently uh, helping in the local elections and aiming to win the third seat in Chilwell and a seat in Mossley Hill as well. So yeah, I'm busy. Yeah. You're, you're reflecting that an upturn in Lib Dem fortunes in the city, but my goodness, from, you know, controlling the city uh, up until 2010, the decline was pretty precipitous. Um, was it a classic example of local councillors being unable to resist national tides in the sense that you paid the price locally for uh, the coalition with the Conservatives nationally? Yes, of course. And, you know, we always have to remember that Liverpool is a Labour city uh, it, and it's also a very poor city, relatively. Um, and just as it had a, a massive hatred for the Conservatives, I mean, when was the last time there was a Conservative MP or indeed a Conservative councillor? When we went into coalition uh, 
with the Conservatives, and some might argue for, for the, the right reasons. I personally was opposed to that. I wanted a, a supply and confidence arrangement where you'd have a, an agreed programme for a fixed time. But the, the, at, at that particular moment, clearly we forget how what a dire straits the, the country was in, but it was... It was cataclysmic for my party. I mean, I, at one stage, I led a group in Liverpool of 73 councillors, and we, we we ended up with, with two. And we gradually, bit by bit, sort of climbed back to now have a, uh, well, 11 councillors, 10, 10 seats we won, and we had one defection of a, of a, of a Labour councillor. So we're back to about 10 or so. Um, but it's it's been hard going. We were comp- And what forget people forget is that for a third party, when you face these moments, as, as the coalition did to us, you not only lose your councillors or your MPs, you also lose your infrastructure, you lose your activists, your deliverers, your members, you know. So, um, and that is difficult to, to, to come back from that. I mean, there are swathes of the country where Lib Dems are literally down to one person and his or her dog, you know. Uh, and it's a big, big, slow process trying to get back again. I should have said at the beginning that Mike and I will be chatting for about uh, half an hour or so, but we'd love to hear any questions you've got, and if you have got any, please put them in the in the chat box. Um, and, 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 and you, you, you said you would have preferred a confidence and supply arrangement. Um, I mean, I, I remember distinctly, because I was uh, working on Radio Merseyside on the afternoon when the coalition was being formed in the Rose Garden, and your successor, Warren Bradley, had sent a sort of telegram or whatever it was, if there's some telegrams going in those days, or an urgent uh, text or communication to Nick Clegg saying, don't do this, um, because he could foresee the damage it would do to the party. I mean, it's a, it's a dreadful dilemma, isn't it, doing what's right in the national interest, but in the back of your mind thinking, this could not really be in, 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 our, in our party's interest, particularly in the north of England, where at the end of the day, Lib Dems were seen on the left of the spectrum rather than on the right. Yes, no, you, you put it very well. I mean, I can't, I can't really add to that, uh, Jim. Um, but that is, that is correct. I mean, I don't think we should forget. Also, I mean, I mean, there are there are Lib, Lib Dems who would be very proud of some of the things we actually persuaded uh, government to achieve. And you can, I'm not going to rattle them off, but you can look at a long list of things that would not have happened. Um, I, I remember one member in Scotland saying, "Well." If anything else, the fact that we we've ended uh, child uh, slavery, you know, where, ch- where, where uh, children who come in as unaccompanied adults are often put in, in or put in sort of prison conditions and had handcuffs on and all the rest, and that was outlawed. And he said that's the only one thing we do. I can be proud of the fact that we achieved that, but my goodness, at what cost? Yeah. Um, now turning to more contemporary matters, I mean, uh, uh, the, the city does seem destined to some extent, perhaps compared to Manchester, which seems to sort of move on fairly serenely, to have these occasional convulsions. I mean, from militant in the 80s, um, you, you had a very successful period, but you, you did have, there were tensions at the top but, uh, during your leadership with the, with the chief executive and then we've had this latest uh, spectacular falling out what's your current take on the situation in liverpool um i think it's very sad indeed um i read the uh the report and um it 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 just beggars belief i mean i was you know i i knew from my wife (laughs) as a just as an ordinary job a counsellor, how poor it was. I mean, you pull the lever and nothing happens. Uh, and, and I was like, but hang on a second, Carol, the bins are overflowing in, in the park. Get onto them. Oh, well, I've tried and I'll bring it up again. Or, you know, simple things just were not happening in the city. So I knew it was, I knew services were pretty poor and you can't blame everything on, on government cuts. Um, but when you see that phrase about a toxic culture, and bullying and harassment for a, a Labour council. You know, <laughs> paraphrasing Kinnock's phrase about a Labour council. A Labour council accused by an independent inspector of harassing and bullying. That is pretty, pretty worrying. And and I think the the corruption with a small C and maybe a capital C that has gone on, which I, I mean, the, the inspector highlighted uh, some of the cases. Um, 
that happened, I, I thought was was just unbelievable. I mean, you always, I always, you know, Liverpool, Liverpool is almost like a village and people talk and you you go into the pub and people come up to you and say, oh, you know, they were saying this to me four or five years ago. Oh, that council's corrupt. You know, they've done so and so and so and so. And I say, oh, yeah, yeah. OK. Uh, and this, but you knew something was going to happen. And of course, in the end, it did. Um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes politics always does end in tears, but hopefully politics doesn't end in, in accusations of corruption. And I mean, where, where have you seen, probably you perhaps you have to go back to the days of T. Dan Smith in the Northeast, where, you know, you've got five ongoing police investigations, seven people with links to the council arrested. Um, are, are, I mean, the system is just is just rotten, quite frankly, and something needs to be done quickly. And I uh, I have to pay tribute to the Labour Council because I had a great uh, uh, Labour Council. I have to pay tribute to the Labour leadership because I felt that after the inspector's report was published and the Secretary of State decided to put in uh, some inspectors to run, run parts of the City Council, I thought this would could easily be turned into... Uh, knowing how much we uh, don't like the Conservatives in Liverpool, how this could be turned into a, oh, the Tories are back running our city. Uh, this is terrible. We've got to vote this down. We don't want the Tories in our city. And the fact that they're independent civil servants had nothing to do with it. But actually, Keir Starman got up and the Labour Party got up and said, no, this is the right thing to do. So um, I admire them on that. And thank you. Do, do you think that attitude uh, by the Labour Party nationally is fully embraced by the Labour group of councillors who are themselves going to be subjected to an investigation by David Hanson? No, no, it's not. Of course it's not. <laughs> and you know, you know that. That's a problem for officers of the council because the, the, polit the Labour politicians most juxtaposed to them are the local councillors, not Keir Starmer and whatever he's doing in London. Yes, I mean, I, uh, the council, like the House of Lords, like Parliament business, is carried out through Zoom. And uh, I sometimes overhear some of the conversations from Zoom meetings of, of council, you know, council officials and council meetings. And uh, clearly it's a very different breed or very different view that from some of the councillors on, on, the, on, on Liverpool City Council, some of the Labour councillors on, on Liverpool City Council. I mean, I think the other thing which... Um, really beggars belief, and I and it's not just it's not just an issue for for Liverpool. It's the whole fact that there isn't proper scrutiny and audit of council work. Uh, if you remember when the coalition uh, got rid of uh, of uh, uh, you know it, 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 a number of of its. Uh, uh, organizations, what's that? I can't think of the name of them, uh, it got rid of the National Audit uh, Office and Liverpool would have, as indeed every other council would have, uh, an audit inspection uh, every three years and that audit inspection was, was, you know, was feared because the audit inspection would actually look at everything that was going on in the council and you would have to make sure that you, in time for the next inspection, you sorted those issues out. Uh, and we'd also every year have an audit letter, which would be a sort of general view about the city. And this was true of every council up and down the country. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. Um, there's no proper audit. It seems bizarre to me that uh, local councils um, tender for their auditors. Well, I'm sure the auditors of the city council are impartial and don't have to respond to their taskmaster, but it, it doesn't strike me with confidence that they're not independent appointed by the council. And if you look at the last few reports, there's no mention of some of the issues that the inspectors have, have discussed. If not, why not? And scrutiny. There's no scrutiny. Initially, there was a scrutiny. The chair of the scrutiny committee came from the independent liberals. Uh, the chair obviously got an allowance. So, uh, you know, it, it, it begs a question about the independence of that scrutiny arrangement. Janderson then decided to abolish scrutiny. And his idea of scrutiny was he'd appear before uh, a group of councillors every so often to answer for his, his, his deeds. But a council needs proper detailed look at, at policies and, and, and uh, reports and what's going on. And if that had happened, none of this 
appalling behaviour would have would have gone unchecked. Well, this is a general problem. Some would say with the mayoral model that uh, it doesn't provide the sort of scrutiny that you, as a sort of conventional leader of Liverpool City Council, uh, was was subjected to. So, um, I mean, as we know at the moment, as far as I know, the referendum is still due to be held in 2023 um, to abolish the post altogether. Labour seem to have fallen out of love with it. And I'm a student of what Richard Kemp, your current leader on the council, says, and he's, he's never been a particular fan. So would you like to see uh, the elected mayor of Liverpool position abolished? I don't think it's about a name particularly. I mean, I think uh, the mayoral model, and if you remember, Liverpool Labour councillors were opposed to it and said we should have a referendum. And then suddenly, Joe Anderson was in favour of it and we were promised some more money, which uh, apparently all the cities got in any case. Uh, the only person who gained out of it was good old Michael Heseltine got the freedom of the city because uh, he got what he wanted, a mayoral model in, in, in Liverpool. Um, <clears throat> When I was, I mean, the argument for a mayoral model is that you need somebody to make sure that you don't go back to the, the city system of a subcommittee looking at something, reporting to the main committee, reporting to the policy and finance committee, and it drags on for 10 or 12 weeks before a decision is made. You want, you want, you know, you want speedy decisions being made. Um, and the model that we used was to have an executive board where any councillor could call in a decision. It was scrutinised. If we couldn't come to an arrangement or couldn't come to an agreement, it would then go for the council to decide. And every single councillor would say yes or no. And probably something like about 10 percent of decisions went to the council for a full debate and a full um, you know, vote. And so the system worked. And, I, and the current system doesn't allow that to happen. The mayor has complete responsibility for everything. And uh, I don't, I don't actually know what councillors do in terms of the governance of the city other than their own, own local ward work and they have particular responsibilities which again are dependent on, on, on the mayor. So I don't think the models work particularly well now. Would you, would, you, would, you, would you abolish it though? Uh, I, I would change it. Um, obviously the... Um, Adapt it. <laughs> Yes, I mean, one of the things you hint at there is what do councillors do? I mean, I think there's still 96 councillors on Liverpool City Council, but the Callow report supported by the Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick, has it seems to be working towards single member wards, all out elections every four years, and less, m many less councillors. Do you support that? No, I certainly don't. I think, again, that... <laughs> so, so I know how hard my wife works as a team of, of two, or actually three, in a sense, uh, in the ward. Uh, it's, it's almost a full-time job dealing with hundreds of emails, visits and all the rest. If she was by herself, it would be really, uh, really hard. And <clears throat> actually, if you're in a, I mean, Chilwell is a, not a particularly deprived community. If you're in a deprived community, it would be really, really hard to do that. And I also wor worry about an individual left to their own devices, uh, you know, on planning issues. At least there's checks and balances if you've got colleague councillors. Um, the other importance of this, and obviously this is downtown in business, so we want to reflect uh, concerns mm -hmm. of the business community. Um, I mean, obviously, under your leadership uh, and um, to some extent under Joe Anderson's, the city's been transformed in terms of its uh, economic base and so on. But do you think that the latest troubles will affect confidence in the business community? I've always believed that councils don't create jobs, they create the conditions for businesses to thrive and to create those jobs. And I think a lot, I mean, I, I don't have intimate knowledge of this anymore because I'm too, too removed from it, but uh, business colleagues that I talk to do not think that the current uh, um, administration has that understanding of, of the needs of the business community. They say to me, um, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're, if your face fits, then you're in and you, you get the contracts and you get the business. But uh, if you're not prepared to go down that road, then you don't get the support that, that you need. And I think that that is quite concerning. What about uh, overall the, the economy of, of the city? Because there are always people waiting out there just saying this is the sort of 
the thing that really depresses me as a person who really loves Liverpool is there are always people out there waiting to say, oh, I told you so, they're going back to the bad old days. This is <coughs> the thing that has to be most concerning, isn't it? Because it's, it's, not, it's not true. It's not the days of the, when the, the, the Albert Dock was silted up and Michael Heseltine didn't know who to contact when he came to the city. I mean, things have been true, <coughs> haven't they? Yes. I, I mean, I... I think you, as I said right at the beginning, Liverpool is a, is a poor city, and um, it's you, the only way that Liverpool can prosper and grow is if businesses are successful, and if we persuade people to come and live here, and the population increases, um, and I, I think Liverpool businesses are can be very inventive. You know, the the, the SMEs have actually weathered the economic and COVID storms incredibly well. Um, I worry about the way, I look at the city centre and two thoughts occur to me. One is <laughs> the amount of graffiti, <laughs> you know, you look, you look at our communities and you see, you know, in, in even in affluent com uh, communities, graffiti and dirt and litter everywhere. People want to li live in a city that is clean and tidy and looks good. If you go into a city which looks, perhaps it isn't, but looks run down, uh, then people question whether they want to invest in that city. And, and secondly, I do think the developments are very much centered on student accommodation, because that's where the money is and the amount of student halls that have gone up. Uh, are disproportionate, in my view, to uh, to what to real development that should be taking place. Um, obviously, the other development since you were leader of the council has been the city region mayor Steve Rotherham is is running that. How do you think um, relations between the city region and the city are? Well, they weren't good, were they? Because. Uh, Joe Anderson, first of all, wanted to be the uh, the, the Metro Mayor, uh, and secondly, he, we didn't get that. And then he wanted the parliamentary seat that uh, Rotherham was vacating, and he didn't get that. And there was clear tension between them. You only have to talk to uh, Labour colleagues to know that was the case. I'm hoping that with a new mayor, that relationship will will change because the Metro mayor, whoever he or she is, needs the Liverpool uh, mayor, whoever he or she is, to work closely together for the good of the whole of the whole region. And uh, if they're not worth the pulling in opposite directions, then that is not uh, that is a recipe for disaster. So it has been difficult though, hasn't it? I mean, you and I, I'm afraid, are long enough in the tooth to remember the Merseyside County Council, which didn't always have wonderful relations with the with the city. I mean, it is difficult when you've got a powerful city in the middle and uh, important, of course, uh, areas around it, uh, that uh, either the city thinks it's being neglected on behalf of the outer regions uh, and the outer regions are, are jealous of what's going on in the city. It's quite a, it's quite a difficult arrangement, isn't it? It works well in Manchester. It works well. Yes. I mean, any any uh, city or metro region, the first thing that's important is, the, you know, the, the, the calibre of the chief executive uh, and the calibre of the officers. And incidentally, I, just going back to your previous question about the report, um, I don't I don't get this, that um, there is no responsibility laying at the, at the, at the foot of officers. What were officers doing when all this was going along? Were they, were they so terrified that they just behaved in an appalling way as well? I, I, I just don't understand that. Officers have to share responsibility for what's happened in, in, in Liverpool. Um, so I just, I, just, I just get that in. So, so, so in any case... Yeah. What, what before we lose that point, I mean, it appears to me from the reading of the Callow report that Tony Reeves, the chief executive of the council, is going to have a key role in working with the commissioners to turn things around. Uh, so I don't think the government feel that the chief executive is, uh, is, 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 is subject to criticism, really. No, I'm not. Well, he was re re relatively newly appointed uh, and he's 
gradually worked to change things. And I think uh, in due course, we'll know exactly his his uh, involvement in bringing about those, those, those changes. Now I'm talking about second and third tier officers who for all sorts of reasons were, were allowed to behave in the way they did. And I just think that is, is not acceptable. Um, but going, going back to your question about, uh, about um, the, the Liverpool city region and, and Liverpool in, in any region and council, you need quality officers and you need um, the, the leader and the chief executive working closely together, but you also um, you you need an understanding of, of what is your vision. You sign up for that vision, and then you share that vision with people, and you develop that vision, and you deliver that vision. And Manchester have done it. We should be doing that in in uh, Liverpool and the Liverpool region as well. Let me just uh, remind you, if you're watching this, thank you very much indeed for giving up your lunchtime to watch this. Um, and uh, if you have any questions for Mike, please put them in the in the chat box, and we'll be delighted to uh, uh, to to take them as, as we as we go on. Um, as I'm no longer constrained by the BBC rules of impartiality and so on, uh, I can give you a free hit on this if you wish to take it. Uh, we are now facing these mayoral elections. Labour has an extremely inexperienced candidate, Joanne Anderson. No, no relation. Um, and some people feel that this would be a chance for another party uh, to actually take it. I mean, you, you slightly surprised me earlier by sort of saying categorically Liverpool's a Labour city. I mean, I, I imagine you aspire to, to change that over time. Well, would this be the opportunity for either your candidate, Richard Kemp, or perhaps Stephen Yip, who's well known as a charity organiser, who's standing as an independent, to actually win uh, on May the 6th? Um, I, I'm going to be very careful what I say here, haven't I? Um, look, if if um, I I thought to myself um, <clears throat> that if there had been a, a candidate who had probably twenty thousand to fifty thousand pounds worth of of money available to him or her, and uh, the support of other parties, uh, and they were well known very well known. Um, I think they could probably have won the seat. What will happen, I've no idea. Richard is Richard Kemp is running a very strong campaign. Uh, but as I said before, we were virtually wiped out in the city. So, you know, I, I don't, I mean, is this going to be one of those sort of seismic moments where people suddenly, although they've had no literature or people knocking at the door or whatever, they say, right, I'm going to vote for Kemp, I'm going to vote for Yip, or I'm, you know, I don't know. I, I, I would be personally delighted if that were the case, but I, I, I can't see it myself, I'm afraid. It's a difficult campaign, isn't it? I mean, obviously, I, I referred earlier to the the, the late and uh, you know, indeed lamented, we all miss him, Trevor Jones, who in the early 70s with you substantially invented pavement politics to actually meet people on the streets. That's been somewhat constrained uh, in, in this election, which is sort of being held under these very strange conditions. <laughs> How are the Lib Dems of all parties uh, faring in that respect? Well, um, it, it has been an opportunity in some respect because I, I, in, in, in my wife's ward, she spent her time phoning people. I think they phoned something like a thousand people just not to say, how are you voting? I mean, this is this is during the pandemic itself. You know, uh, how are you? Do you need any support, any help? I know some councillors have set, got involved in, 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 in food banks. Uh, other councillors have done welfare work. So actually... In terms of the role of ward councillors, it's been a, a, a time where they've not spent all their uh, moments going into the city centre for meetings. They've actually probably been able to engage with their, their residents in a more intimate way. Um, that we, they've held, you know, resident Zoom meetings, for example, which have been a great way of, of involving people. So rather than people having to go to cold halls or school halls they've they've been able to to zoom and, and talk about issues uh we had one here about a, a, a cycle lane which uh simon o'brien who who i don't know he still is was joe anderson's uh, cycling and walking um lead. Zah. Zah. Zah, that was the word yes these these <laughs> these soviet terms still still apply the czar yes the czar for cycling and walking you will walk um he he came along to that Zoom meeting, I think it was in like 50 people, and it was very good, you know. So 
you can ch- it has given opportunity to change working working practices as as businesses have found um i don't know what will happen for example be interesting to hear what uh, the business community have to say on this i mean presumably many businesses won't want to go back to the uh city center headquarters uh, having to pay quite high high rents perhaps they'll want to increasingly work from home my daughter who's a solicitor and be working from home has been told by her very large company that um, they are she's in birmingham that they'll be um, only working two days when they go back to normality whatever normality is they'll only be working two days a week uh, in in the office the rest of the time will be doing zoom at home um, and it works very well indeed saves money uh, we, the, the, you've now raised a very important uh, question about the, the future of our city centres, both in terms of retail sure. and in t- in t- in also in terms of office. And what I often say to uh, Frank McKenna, our managing director, what are the implications on the transport investment front? I mean, ha- will that have to be tweaked at all? Um, I mean, do you do you, do you see um, a real marked reluctance of people to return to? offices in the city centres, to shop in the city centres, to return to those commuting runs, you know, I mean, we have a pretty good train service in Merseyside with Merseyrail and so on, but do you see it being transformational or do you think eventually everything will get back to normal? I think it'll be transformational in the sense that, first of all, We've realised the that you, you can in, you can engage with people through uh, virtually, uh, and it works perfectly well. Actually, um, in some ways, it works better. Uh, secondly, sadly, home deliveries have become so ingrained that I wonder if that that will will go will go back to to shopping in the way we used to do. So I think it will be transformational. And it, as you rightly say, it will affect our cities in all sorts of ways. And we need to be thinking now about how we develop our cities in the light of these changes, uh, how we promote them, how we develop them for tourists, because that's going to be hugely, hugely important. I mean, I have my own views about that, but I I think um, it, it it is really, really important that now, and we don't leave it just to find out and say, oh, let's just see how it turns out. That, that, would, be, that would be crazy. I think now we need to be looking at, uh, at patterns, coming up with ideas, uh, testing them and seeing whether they can be applied. Yes. Well, the visitor economy is going to, for that reason, possibly going to play an increasingly important role for Liverpool. And we just have to restate once again this huge asset of cruise liners being able to come right up to the city centre, which isn't the case in many places, like South Africa. And we've really got to capitalise on, on that. Do you, do you think enough's being done about that or could more be done to get our city on the, on the cruise liner circuit? Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I. It, it was. It was my administration who brought in the cruise liner terminal and business, and it has developed really well. And I'm. I'm pleased that that has has happened. And I think it's got the potential to grow even further. And as you rightly perceive, and I hadn't thought about this, that you can actually bring the cruise liners right into the heart of the city, right onto the waterfront, that iconic waterfront. And uh, so that's a real plus. So it's a bit like saying, you know, back in back in in, in the. In, in 98 i was saying what are the things that we can develop you know we we um, we haven't got an arena or a convention center and yet we're the capital of pop and we turn away all these these conferences we, you know we've slipped down the the, the lead table for, for retail what are the things we need to develop and i think we should almost in a sense be doing that now what are what are our unique selling points that we can invest in now which other cities haven't got and you've hit on one of them. That's absolutely important. And we mustn't forget, of course, the importance of our of our universities, our three or four universities. They're, they're going to play a, a crucial part. But somebody needs to be coming up with these ideas now. So maybe um, as this is being hosted by downtown, I'll, I'll put that challenge to downtown and to its uh, members. Come on, you come forward, uh, not now, but you come forward as a, an organisation which represents businesses and say, what are the things that we could be doing to develop our city when we come out of, 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 of COVID. 
Well, there's a challenge. Um, maybe we can start that today if anybody would like to come on the chat box and give give their thoughts about that. Um, if I may, Mike, I'd like to, to turn to the, the, the national national position uh, at the moment. I mean, nationally, the Lib Dems are at a, at a low ebb. Does Zed Davey have the stature and charisma to turn things around? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, I... <laughs> Being charismatic, <laughs> we see where that leads. Leads. Uh, we've had some charismatic leaders in our, our city. We only remembers Derek Hatton to name, but uh, uh, one where that can lead to. Um, look, uh, it will be for my party, both nationally and locally. It will be a hard slog getting back, and that hard slog will start at a local level. And. Uh, in two weeks' time, uh, um, local election night, you'll see that Lib Dems will end up with, with quite substantial gains in local election seats. I saw the latest opinion polling put us in double figures. We went up to 10%, uh, an, an increase of 3%. Uh, the Tories on 44 with plus one, Labour on 34, minus two, and the Greens on four, minus one. Uh, and if the uh, Tories win the Hartlepool by-election in the you know, heart of what was Labour territory, then that really is a, a, going to be a struggle for, for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. In terms of my party, next next general election, we've also got boundary changes that will affect us. So it, it's going to be, hopefully, getting out of the two taxis and getting into a coach for us. It'll be, you know, hoping to get to up to 20 plus plus seats. And that will, that will be hard. But... Um, it's the way things are. Um, and, uh, well, I'll say any more than that. No, no, well, I'm, I'm grateful for you giving a realistic uh, appraisal. Very often when one does interviews with politicians, you get, oh, yes, we're going to win everything. And I, I think that that's a, a realistic appraisal. But to, to what extent, you know, I mean, extending it even further out, it just occurs to me that, uh, and I never expected this, that we seem on in global politics, with the possible exception of Joe Biden, that the trend is towards populist um, and uh, centre right or right wing administrations. The, the idea, you know, the sort of uh, Bill Clinton idea, the Nick Clegg period, uh, Trudeau, uh, the idea that um, there could be a uh, the centre left could broadly dominate uh, politics seems to be succumbing to what people are voting for, which is nationalism and populism. Yes, and that is potentially a very worrying trend. I mean, clearly, politicians and governments have to listen to people and they try and reflect the good in people <laughs> rather than the, rather than the uh, nationalistic trends in people. But no, it's a, it's, it is a very worrying trend. And um, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that in, in, in this country, by and large, we are still a uh, a liberal democracy. We, we we haven't succumbed to some of the sort of, you know, uh, the Farage element didn't win through, didn't break through. Um, but that hasn't been the case in in other European countries where we've seen the rise of of nationalism at, and in some countries at its at its worst. Well, you mentioned Farage there, and uh, he's going to go down in history as one of the most extraordinary politicians, mm -hmm. uh, because never elected to the House of Commons, but arguably had one of the most profound effects on this country that anyone has had. And obviously, I refer to him, his desire to get us out of the European Union. The Liberal Democrats were so identified with, with Europe. Um, do you do you now accept that any question of returning to the European Union is right off the agenda for a generation? Probably. I mean, I think uh, you can still be. I mean, the result was pretty close. Remember, <laughs> I suspect if it was held now with the with the controversy over vaccinations, it would be. <laughs> I, I've I've heard sort of die in the wool European friends of mine, die in the wool EU friends of mine, saying, "Well, thank goodness we weren't in the EU, otherwise I wouldn't have had my vaccine." So, um, I, I think that um, we can remain a very strong pro-European party. I think that. Um, there are still a lot of real problems about not being in the EU, which will start to manifest themselves. Uh, and we'll see that um, we have, in some respects, been uh, told some porkies ab about the future. And I think in you know in a generation, 10 years, 
we could well be campaigning to rejoin the EU. But now the, the electorate have decided, a bit like Scotland, and uh, we should be um, remain, uh, we are obviously pro-European uh, country, but we should accept the result of the, of the electorate, which we are doing. Turning to the House of Lords, it's uh, had a bit of a bad press recently. What strikes me is some of the conservative newspapers um, being pretty critical of the House of Lords. Um, what do you see as the, as the future for, for the upper chamber? <clears throat> this is a very difficult, uh, for me quite difficult, because um, I, 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 I suppose the question, I've, I've always, I do a lot of outreach work uh, for Parliament, going into schools and talking about Parliament. And when you talk to young people about the House of Lords and they understand that it is totally unelected and that actually a group of the, uh, and it, the, the peers are appointed by the, the, the party bosses, if you like, and that a group of peers are hereditary peers where it's the, you know, it's the sons, not the daughters and all the rest. They just can't believe it. They just cannot understand that. Um, but when you start talking to them, uh, and I, I'm very much in favour of an elected uh, house, but it has to, but we have to be very careful in that we don't want to replicate um, the Commons. I mean, one of the beauties of the House of Lords is that it is a real check and balance on, on government. Um, <clears throat> And, and we've seen that over, you know, over time, you know, and a whole host of issues from, you know, ensuring, for example, that uh, we Al Dubs amendment on creating a program for unaccompanied child refugees, on applying uh, applying extra checks to the Trade Union Act to protect trade unions, to ensuring protection for homeowners affect, uh, affected by the uh, building HS2 in my area. Uh, special educational needs uh, that children who have special education needs get the same protection in academy schools, ban on smoking of parents carrying children in their cars, a whole raft of things which would not have happened if it had not been for the House of Lords. Um, and I, I, I've got my phone on here because there's a, a vote happening <laughs> any moment. I'll be voting remotely. And we regularly, not the Lib Dems, but the House regularly votes down the government. And the government goes away and thinks about it and hopefully comes back with some sort of agreement about how we move forward. And the other area is that I, my first debate I attended in the House Lord was on, on your area, Jim, it was on broadcasting. And I was, there was Lord Grade speaking, there was Joan Bakewell speaking, there was John Bird speaking, these great, you know, broadcasters who knew what they were talking about. And I just went, wow. And you'd lose that. You'd just have, you know, a, a, a carbon copy if you're not careful of a of of a House of Commons. I mean, you only have to look at America to see the problems between the Congress and the Senate. We don't want to be in that situation. One of the beauties of of the House of Lords is that it is it is fiercely independent and votes. Well, it, do, it doesn't have to vote the way the party whips tell them to do. You know, they will <laughs> they will vote how they feel, and that's that is. That is paramount to me. Yes, um, well, um, um, my own humble suggestion is that I mean I, I I absolutely take your point about the expertise in the House of Lords. I mean we all remember Lord Winston with the all the delicate legislation on fertility and all that sort of thing, and he brought great expertise. And it would be a, a real shame to lose that. And I think perhaps a percentage of a reformed House of Lords should still be available for people to be nominated by a completely independent committee for their expertise, perhaps 20%. And then another thing that needs to be addressed is, of course, the regional disparity. You are a glorious exception in many ways. I think it's 60, 65% of peers come from the southeast of England. So maybe elections from regional constituencies would, would help to remedy that. What do you think of those two ideas? Yes, and I'll, I'll add to that, Jim. Uh, one of the, if you remember, one of the <clears throat> agreements of the coalition uh, government, uh, or the coalition agreement, was that we would uh, move towards an elected House of Lords. And of course, that didn't happen for all sorts of reasons. But one of the proposals in that, in the, the Clegg bill for the reform of the House of Lords, was that you were there for a limited period of time, as 10 years. So you couldn't, in a sense, be, uh, you couldn't have the, the party whips uh, lean on you and say, 
well, if you don't support us on this, <clears throat> we won't be supporting your uh, re renomination to the, the House of Lords. That, that you know, so that I think that's an important check and balance uh, on on any on any reform. Uh, you talk about the south, uh, the south east in terms of the north, of the south of England in terms of the number of peers. I have to tell you that um, the borough, the London borough of Richmond, has five. Lib Dem peers more than in the northwest. <laughs> well, that is, that is another point. I mean, you know, some uh, some people say to me, I mean, rather bitterly about your party that the Lib Dems are sort of overrepresented in the House of Lords. It's sort of a reflection of a of a past era, and if your current level of support, you don't deserve it, and there should be some sort of um you know balancing act done after every general election to sort of reflect it but then i suppose it, that would fall fall foul of your concern about it just being another chamber just an echo chamber for the house of commons yes and it was one of the good things that nick clegg did for us one of his lasting legacies that he created the largest uh lib liberal group in in the world i.e the lib dems in the house of lords at one stage we were 102 <laughs> Well, we're, um, our time is beginning to draw to a close, and uh, and I don't want to do that without reflecting on the fact that uh, you've lost two very valuable Northwest members of the House of Lords from the Liberal Democrats recently. Uh, perhaps we could come on to Shirley Williams shortly, but first of all, I'd like you to say a word about Tony Greaves, somebody who I interviewed over the years, a Lancashire, um, a proud Lancastrian, um, a Pendle councillor, uh, not always in agreement with the party leader, um, often a thorn in the side, and wasn't particularly in favour of the merger with the SDP, I don't think. What, what are your reflections on Tony? Well, I shared an office with Tony, so uh, and it was quite an experience, I tell you. Um, he, uh, in the way he operated, uh, so he could be extremely grumpy. Uh, he could be extremely volatile. He could be extremely extremely obliging and, and helpful. You'd go in sometimes and say, morning, Tony, and he'd just be so in his box, you know, working that he'd just completely ignore you. And other times he'd burst into song. I mean, he was an amazing character, but a genuine um, liberal through and through, uh, a real tour de force in terms of his knowledge and ability. I mean, if ever I was struggling for something, you know, if there's an issue about, I remember saying, Terry, do you know anything about Japanese knotweed? And he'd tell me everything about Japanese knotweed. Uh, Terry, could you tell me something about this EU regulation? He'd know all about it. And of course, he's still a local councillor as well uh, in, in Lancashire. So an amazing person. And uh, I got to become very close to Tony. He didn't have in the House of Lords uh, many, many colleagues. Uh, many friends um and uh, i got very close to him and i funny enough i was delivering our focus newsletter when my phone pinged and i looked at it and it was a message saying he died and i was, I was in absolute shock uh, it affected me quite considerably but i thought to myself well he'd like me to know he'd like me to know when i was actually out delivering community newsletters no I, I, a great loss not just to to the lib dev not just a great loss to uh to the House of Lords, but also, of course, to, to Lancashire as well. Um, and then we come to, to Shirley Williams. Uh, I must say that reading her obituary in the papers was like a, a, a history of my career in broadcasting, because it came all the way back to the 1970s when she was a Labour Minister, Secretary of State for Education, and then the struggle with the, uh, the left in her party and that momentous decision to become a member of the SDP and of course the first SDP MP for the seat of Crosby just north of uh, of your city Michael uh, general general thoughts and I'll come back with one or two further questions on Shirley Williams um well I the first time I met Shirley Williams was I went to help obviously in the Crosby by-election and I stood outside chanting shirls a pearl shirls a pearl and um she won and uh, Trevor and I invited her for lunch the next day and uh, we invited her to the Nautical Training College which was a, an epi college training uh, waiters and chefs for, for you know uh, the shipping uh, industry and needless to say she was 40 minutes late <laughs> but we didn't mind it was Shirley and we went into the restaurant and there was a young lad who was carrying there were all sorts of you know in awe of her, there was a young lad carrying a, a, a tray of glasses and he looked at her. I was so 
pleased and delighted to see her that he forgot he was carrying this tray of glasses and probably dropped it and <laughs> this large smashing sound and, and Shirley was sort of more concerned about him than she was about any bits of flying fragments of glass and uh, no, lo lovely. And when I went to the, uh, the House of Lords, she straight away uh, found me and said, you've got to take on education and this is what I want you to do. And uh, I did. And she uh, she was very friendly with the former uh, uh, chief executive, uh, no, what do they call them, the, of the NUT, Fred Jarvis. And uh, she and he was then in his 90s and we'd have lunch a couple of times together. Uh, but uh, amazing. And when she spoke in the chamber, she never had, she never wrote her speeches out. I mean, she literally might have a card with two or three points on and she'd be talking about some ma major international uh, occurrence. And she would have, honestly, she would have the house in the palm of her hand. She was a fantastic speaker. And you can remember that when you wa would watch her on the BBC Question Time, you know, and she would, uh, she was very, very, uh, very, very effective on that. And, and always had, seemed to, or to me at any rate, always seemed to have the um, audience on her side. The Prime Minister we never had. Well, uh, well, yes. Okay, let's let's deal with that one. You know, I mean, it, 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 the, it, is it not the case that women often have this sort of self doubt, which seems to elude men very often? And you know, we've heard in recent days about how she just didn't feel she she had it, or or because she was disorganised, she wouldn't have been a, a good Prime Minister. I put it to you that a lot of men in that position wouldn't have that self doubt, and uh, you know, perhaps she should have pushed herself a bit harder. Yes, Jim, at the beginning, earlier on, you were talking to me about this inexperienced Joanne Anderson, the Labour candidate for mayor in the city. Well, who was, when was the last time we had a woman leader in Liverpool? No. We didn't. We haven't, have we? No. No. Um, and I think that is a, uh, that is a shame on our, on our culture. And thank goodness that is, is changing. Uh, because you know, we, we, we need we need to uh, we need to stop. What I'm, what I'm what I'm asking is about Shirley. I mean, the, the other thing is that no. David the point I was trying to make was that she was she was at a time where it wasn't about her lack of experience. It was about the it was about the preserve of men. It was regarded as the preserve of men to be the prime minister. It wasn't you know it wasn't it wasn't regarded as the preserve of women and the same of of leadership of councils in my view of the great councils. Um, David Owen has said in recent days that if Shirley Williams had been the leader of the party instead of Roy Jenkins uh, in 1983, that you might have done a lot better? David Steele said that, not Roy. Oh, not right. David Owens. Yeah, David Steele said, had it been, had it been Shirley Williams, uh, they, well, they got to 28%, of course, which was an amazing achievement. I mean, that wasn't in the opinion polls. That was an actual result of 28%. And they were, you know, a few more percentage points would have tipped them actually into, into, into major opposition. Um, no, I think it's Shirley, because she, she had this ability, didn't she, to, to uh, connect with people. You know, there are, the leaders who are successful and are those who can connect with people. Boris Johnson has that. Paddy Ashdown has has that. Um, I think probably what well, Tony Blair had that to connect with people, and that's that's a sort of a gift that leaders need. And I would suggest I don't want to embarrass you with Ed Davy, but until you get someone like that. Um, who can stand out from the crowd. I mean, Jeremy Thorpe, I know retrospectively Jeremy Thorpe has got his critics and so on, but he sort of projected the party above, above, you know, uh, campaigning above its, above its normal strength. That's what he delivered. That's what... Well, I, I must tell you another person who has it. <laughs> it was Charles Kennedy, of course. Charles Kennedy could, could engage with people and people for some reason just clicked with him. And I remember him coming to Liverpool and we had this event in Liverpool. We had this event and there were 50 or so people there and it was a meet Charles Kennedy. And he started to speak and he started talking about rural affairs, nothing about the city. But it didn't matter actually because he was so engaging and told a few jokes that everybody thought it was a fantastic evening. And I thought, 
Oh my gosh, we're in Liverpool. Why are you not talking about the problems of cities, talking about rural affairs? But he had that that knack, that ability to to relate to people. And uh, you, you're right, or we're right, that um, successful leaders, and maybe that's the same, in, well, perhaps it's not, I'm going to say, is that the same in business? I don't know. Are success, do successful business men and women have that ability to engage with their, with their, with their staff and make it happen? Mike, it's been fantastic uh, to chat to you about all these uh, issues, both current and past. Thank you very much indeed for giving your time up. You've been in our downtown den guests, and uh, we shall be having more chats with more people uh, over, over the coming weeks. It's been a pleasure. I'm just disappointed that there were no questions. I must have, um, as much as you tried to flog the questions in the chat, nobody was forthcoming. So uh, we've obviously either uh, bored them or intimidated them, or, or there was nobody there. So <laughs> I'm, sure I'm sure we've covered all the ground. That must be the explanation. You're blushing, Jim. That's the first time I've seen you blushing, Agent. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much indeed for your time. My pleasure. If you enjoyed that video, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel on the link below and be among the first to get to listen to all the latest interviews through the Downtown Den.